Our first speaker is Nicolas, and he'll be talking about learning smoothly, machine learning with your robust neural networks at Yale. He comes from the University of Sydney, and let me welcome Nicolas. Um, I'm going to detach this microphone because bending down here is a little, a little difficult for me. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Nick. I'm from Sydney in Australia. Um, I'm actually with the Australian Centre for Robotics in Sydney. Um, and I'm not uh, really kind of like a Julia dev. I'd consider myself more of an end user. And I have a background in control engineering. So most of my life I've been doing things like robotics, aerospace engineering, um, control stuff. And it's really only in the last few years that I've kind of discovered the world of machine learning. And Julia has been fantastic for that. And the tools and you know packages provided for that just make it really, really easy. So what I'm going to uh, present on today is actually this new package uh, myself and our lab have created called robustneuralnetworks.jl. Basically, this package takes some kind of really cool ideas that we've had in control engineering for the last like 60 years and sticks it inside neural networks. And that's something that we originally had the idea for, for the purposes of robotic control and learning with robotic control. But it turns out it translates really well to all sorts of robust, robustness problems in machine learning. So this is more like a general kind of machine learning talk with a bit of a kind of uh, control flavor to it. So hope you'll enjoy. So we'll start with just a little bit of motivation. Why do we want robust neural networks? Well, that's generally because neural networks are, in their current state, not super robust. So the classic example is something like an image classifier. Maybe you have like a convolutional neural network that you've trained to take images of animals, and it can tell you what type of animal it is. So in this case, we've got a classifier on the left that tells us that this is a panda. But the problem with these neural networks is that they're very brittle. They're very sensitive to changes to the inputs that can completely destroy the outputs. So in this case, we add just little bits of noise to the image. And in fact, on the right-hand side, you can barely see that the image is perturbed with the human eye. And yet, that tricks the classifier into thinking it's a given. So it's completely changed the classification just with small tweaks to the inputs. Why do we care about that? Let's think of something like a self-driving car. Maybe you've got some classifier or some segmentation algorithm some neural network that takes this image of pedestrians walking in front of the car, and then on the top right-hand side, it can kind of identify in red what are pedestrians. So these are obstacles that it obviously wants to avoid. Now, with just a small perturbation to the image again, so down the bottom left, I don't know if you can actually see on the projector, but it's slightly perturbed, a little bit more grainy, uh, but we can still clearly see there are pedestrians in that image. The segmentation is completely broken. It thinks it's a completely different scene. The neural network is completely tricked and cannot see the pedestrians anymore. That's really dangerous, right? That's something we don't want our self-driving cars to do. We want our self-driving cars to avoid hitting people. So that kind of robustness is something that we want to carry into our neural networks so we don't have these problems all the time. And in particular, this is not just a problem for those static neural networks, things like convolutional neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons, whatever. It's also the case with dynamic neural networks, neural networks that have some sort of memory associated with them, so like an RNN, recurrent neural network. So this is a great example from back in 2018, uh, this paper by Kalini and Wagner. They effectively showed that uh, with one of the great, like deep, it was called deep speech, one of these great um, voice recognition neural networks at the time. Uh, so it would take in some sort of audio waves of people talking and then be able to reproduce speech. They could design really, really simple and really efficient adversarial attacks to completely change the output of the neural network, again, with just small perturbations to the inputs. So our problem at the moment is that neural networks are not, in general, robust. And while there are ways of making them slightly more robust, there's no kind of like really efficient way of doing it until we came up with our robust neural networks. And in particular, this package, like I said, it's kind of for general machine learning, but with a bit of a control engineering flavor, which we'll get to towards the end of it. And it includes two types of neural networks at the moment static networks and dynamic or memoryful um, recurrent networks. In particular, we satisfy two properties. First, these networks naturally satisfy some sort of built-in robustness and stability guarantees. So what I mean by that is we've taken these ideas from robust control and we've encoded them into the construction of the neural network. So we don't have to impose extra constraints. We just build neural networks that naturally are constructed to satisfy some robustness properties, which I'll get into in a little bit. 
And in particular, we wanted to make sure that these were still usable for our daily machine learning purposes. So we didn't want to have special solvers or special gradient descent methods that we had to apply. We just wanted this to kind of work, which is, I guess, a very Julia way of thinking about things. And so we tried to make sure these networks are compatible with standard machine learning tools, things like auto differentiation or I guess Flux, the machine learning library in Julia is something we've built this around, and just like things like stochastic gradient descent. So we have our robustness properties in this package, and in particular, we've tried to make it usable. So that's kind of an overview of why we've made this package. Um, I'm gonna take you through three things now. I'm gonna first go through a little bit on what the neural networks are, what they actually look like. This will get a little bit theoretical, a little bit of maths, but I'll try not to go too deep into it. Then I'll talk about a little bit about the package structure itself, how I've built it, what it's kind of defined on. Quite simply, it's a few abstract types and multiple dispatched over that. Um, so it's nice and intuitive, wraps around flux. And then I'll talk about a few use cases of this. This is something, these, these neural networks is something we've really only come up with in the last few years at my lab. Uh, so we're very much looking for use cases for this. So if you think this is relevant to you and something you can apply in your research or your work, please come chat to me afterwards. I'm happy to uh, talk you through it as well. So we'll start with the model structures. Like I said, we've got two types of neural networks in our package. We've got these static ones and dynamics ones. So the static ones are kind of simple. We'll start with them. We call them Lipschitz bounded deep networks. I'll talk about what a Lipschitz bound is a little later. But basically the structure is something like this. We've got a neural network that has some inputs X, some outputs Y, goes through a bunch of weight matrices with activation functions. So your tan H's, your relus, whatever. And it's pretty pretty standard structure. So convolutional neural networks look like this. Deep, dense networks look like this. Pretty standard structure. Um, it's not so much the structure that's important for us. It's the way we encode the robustness, which I'll get to in a bit. But what allows us to encode the robustness is actually thinking about this in a very different way. Instead of just thinking it as like a straightforward, feed-forward neural network, we actually pull apart the weights and the activations. And we draw it as something like this. So if you're used to looking at maths, look down the bottom right. If you're used to looking at diagrams, look down the bottom left. And if you want a bit of both, you can flick between the two. Mathematically and pictorially, these are exactly the same as the top image of my feed-forward neural network. I've just kind of moved the pictures of the weights around here. But it turns out that by thinking about a single layer neural network with feedback in the loop, so that's what all the kind of like loop arrows are here, that's exactly equivalent to a multi-layer neural network that just connects things in series. So connecting in parallel with one layer is the same as connecting in series with many layers. And in fact, thinking about it this way, we can actually then group the linear and the nonlinear parts of our network and simplify our block diagrams even more and write our dense neural network as something like this, where our G here is a linear system, so it's just a linear operation of matrices, and that's in feedback with some sort of non-linearity. So this is your activation function, your relus, your tan h's, your sigmoids, whatever. And it's actually by looking at things in this structure where we separate the linear and the non-linear components. This is where it ties back into the kind of robust control theory, if anyone's familiar, familiar with that kind of stuff. But basically, that's a very common way of looking at non-linear systems in control. You basically isolate the linear stuff, which we understand very well, and then you group all the complicated non-linear stuff, which we don't understand, and we sort of just approximate what's going on there. And that leads me to the second neural network structure that we have in our package, which is the recurrent equilibrium network. So this is actually a more general case, the static case, the LBDNs fit within this structure. And it basically looks the same. And I've got my you know, Julia logo superimposed on this. But effectively, we have some linear system G. So this is now a dynamical system. And we've got some uh, nonlinear part, which is the green stuff up the top, which are our activation functions. Mathematically, it looks like this. Basically, this is just one big matrix multiplication fed through a ReLU or a tan H. Everything in purple there corresponds to our linear system, so it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications. And you can kind of group things together into like weights and biases as we're used to thinking about neural networks. Um, the only restriction on our activation functions is we have to have this sort of monotone slope restricted property. In plain English, that just means the maximum slope of the activation function has to be one. So if it's less than one, you can scale it up to one. It's not hard to do. So something like a sigmoid, you could make work with this as well. So most common activation functions fit this criteria anyway, so it's not really a uh, restrictive um, condition. So that's the structure of our networks. And in fact, you might ask, why do we use these? Because these, these kind of neural networks, you know, it sort of looks like a recurrent neural network if you're familiar to looking at, uh, familiar with looking at those kind of things. It turns out this model structure, this architecture, is very, very general. And inside it, if you set some of these A's, B's, C's, and D's to zero in a particular structure, you can actually reproduce 
all of these neural networks. We can have dense networks, convolutional networks, residual networks, uh, recurrent neural networks. We can actually replicate all of those structures with our equilibrium network uh, framework. So we're not actually restricting the model class. This kind of encompasses most of the stuff we're used to using in our daily machine learning lives. We've just got a general model structure that we can group everything under, which is useful because then when we do our kind of robustness stuff, we have one model structure that we're trying to parameterize, not half a million that we have to do special things for. So that's what our models actually look like. The really interesting part about this package is that we have built in stability and robustness guarantees. And this is where the ideas from kind of robust control theory come into it. So what do I mean by stability and robustness? This is where things get a little bit extra abstract, but it actually has a pretty intuitive uh, um, interpretation as well. The first, when I say stability for a dynamical system, so something with memory, so recurrence, uh, what I mean by stability is that things converge over time, basically, which is kind of intuitive. You know, if things are stable, we expect signals to converge over time. Fundamentally, it's this thing called contraction, which is a property uh, that people use for a nonlinear dynamical system. Basically just means if I start my system at two different initial states and I give it exactly the same input sequence, then the outputs can, or then the states converge to exactly the same thing. And in fact, this is actually one of my recurrent equilibrium networks that I've used to create this GIF. I've just started it at two initial conditions, given it some sinusoidal input, and you can see the signals converging over time. So when I say stability, that's what I mean. And that's a pretty general notion and something that we use quite a bit in our like, control theory stuff. Works pretty well for machine learning as well. When I talk about robustness, there's a few different metrics. The most important and the one I guess I can relate most easily to some of the motivation I showed you at the start is this thing called a Lipschitz bound. So for those that don't know, Lipschitz bounds are just this variable gamma over here. Basically, it means that if I have small changes to the input of my network, then the changes to the output of the network will be bounded and also small. So a small Lipschitz bound means the model is in some ways more smooth. That's what this GIF is kind of showing just for like a function on the left. So basically the shaded regions are kind of quantifying the Lipschitz bound, which is in this case just like the maximum slope of the function. So on the left, I've got a nice smooth function and I've got kind of like lots of white space. That basically means if I change the x value a little bit, then f of x doesn't change a huge amount. So it's nice and smooth. So if you think about our classifiers at the start, if I perturb the image with some random noise just a little bit, then it doesn't tell me that I have a gibbon instead of a panda, or it doesn't tell me that there are no pedestrians on the road instead of four. Whereas if I have a really noisy function or some kind of complicated unsmooth function, small changes to the inputs can cause really large changes to the outputs. And that's where that brittle behavior on neural, neural networks kind of comes into it more. So by imposing small Lipschitz bounds on our models, we can actually make them more smooth and in that way more robust. There's a few other definitions of robustness we use, which I won't go into, but if you're interested, again, come chat to me afterwards, and I'm happy to go into detail. So we've got our stability and our robustness, and the way we encode them in our neural networks is actually through this idea, what we like to call a direct parameterization. Basically, we construct the model parameters in such a way that they automatically satisfy robustness constraints. So we're not taking our model and then imposing constraints, we're constructing our model such that it already satisfies constraints. The way we do this, if you think about our kind of recurrent equilibrium network structure, we've got our weights and our biases there. We basically define some mapping from this theta, which is sort of some set of free, learnable, trainable parameters, whatever you want to call it. Those are, if you're used to using flux, if you go your flux.params, that's what these are. So there's something free in you know, anything in real space and you can just choose some real number and then that's what we do our learning over. Then we do some mapping that actually takes these free, uh, free parameters and puts them in this complicated mathematical formula, which basically makes sure that the event eventual model satisfies some sort of robustness properties. So these pictures here are kind of showing what I like a visualization, I guess, of what the sets look like. So if you think of our free parameters are basically anything in space, so you can choose any real number. Uh, and whereas our kind of like explicit model structure might be this really complex set that defines what a robust neural network actually looks like, but we don't have to worry about defining that complex set. We've just got this function mapping between the two. So basically we train with our free parameters, we map into our robust space, and then we can use our networks like that. So that's kind of how the theory works out, and that's actually pretty closely related in how I've structured the package as well. So I'll take you through that now and you'll get to see a little bit more Julia code from now on. So the package structure as well, basically, like I said at the start, we do multiple dispatch over some abstract types. 
those abstract types are effectively these params. So I have one for our recurrent equilibrium networks, or RENs, these are the dynamic ones. And then we also do it separately for the static ones, even though mathematically they're within the structure of the recurrent ones, it's much faster if you just want like a dense network that has no memory uh, to just keep it separate. So very fast, efficient for code. So we have our model parameterization. We have some constructors that basically take uh, instances of these parameterizations and convert them to our explicit models, which are all subtypes of our abstract REN or abstract LBDN. So some of the model parameterizations we support, we've got our contracting RENs, our Lipschitz RENs, like I mentioned before, and then a few others as well. And on the LBDN side, uh, the L in LBDN stands for, well, the LB stands for Lipschitz bounded. So all of those satisfy our robustness properties. And we've got this thing called the sandwich FC, basically the paper where we introduced this, we called it the sandwich layer, because when you look at the, the maths, it kind of like actually sandwiches layers together. Anyway, that sandwich layer is basically, you could take a flux dense layer, for example, remove it from your code, stick in your sandwich layer. The interface is exactly the same, except you get a free Lipschitz bound, which is pretty cool because that means you have robustness built in straight away. How do we actually build these models? It effectively amounts to, you define some sort of inputs and outputs. So I'll say I want one input, 10 internal states, 20 neurons and an output. Then I can construct my parameterization, which I do separately. So this is, I am saying I want a contracting REN in this case, and then I stick it in uh, the REN wrapper and basically that constructs the model that we can then evaluate on data. So the first thing here, the parameterization describes everything about the model and its parameterization. Whereas when I have my variable model here, that is the thing that we'd actually evaluate on data. So one is the thing we train on, the other is the thing that we actually evaluate on data. Um, and you can see here that yeah, the model parameters, the subtypes of our REN params and the model itself is a subtype of our abstract REN. In terms of training a model with our package, it's, so I'm just gonna take you through, I guess, like simple syntax in Flux, and it's gonna be basically exactly the same thing. So if I was using Flux, I'd maybe create some dense network. So this is just a network with one input, one output, and 10 hidden neurons. Um, let's say I create a loss function, which is the mean squared error, and I know I've got blank spaces in there, but you'll see why shortly. Um, so maybe I just have the mean squared error on some data and some outputs create some random training data, and you could call this whatever you want and put any sort of complicated training data you want in here, but the general structure is the same, then we just kind of train it. That's how you do things with the flux dense model. This is how you do things with our package. You can see here, there's not a lot of difference. Basically, the only thing that changes is that we actually have the model construction inside the loss function. The reason for that is when we construct our model using this LBDN wrapper or the REN wrapper or whichever one, that's what takes our parameterization, so our free parameters that we can do our training on, and it maps it to our model structure which we evaluate on data. Now that mapping is something we want to differentiate through because that's where kind of all the magic happens. So we need to include it inside the loss function just so that when we take uh, our gradients, when we do flux.train, the autodiff engine knows to actually search through that path and uh, you know, take derivatives through um, that mapping from our trainable parameters to the actual model that gets evaluated on data. Now, that can be annoying for a few people who are used to using Flux and not having to create models inside their loss function. So we actually have a wrapper, which means you don't have to do that. You can create the model outside. The only caveat is that we've just kind of hidden where the mapping actually occurs. So now every time you call the model, then it creates that mapping from our free parameters to uh, the explicit model that you evaluate on data. Um, this method is really useful if you do sort of standard machine learning, any sort of supervised learning. I just use this because the syntax is then identical to Flux. If you're doing things like reinforcement learning, often you want to evaluate your model many, many times before you update the parameters. So it doesn't make sense to make the same mapping from your free parameters to your explicit model every time you call it. That's where I'd go back to the other method here. Uh, you can just kind of create the model once, run it a bunch of times, then update the parameters and then recreate it again. So we've kind of separated those two things just to allow flexibility. And if you are training recurrent equilibrium networks with the dynamics, then it's basically the same structure as you would use to train an RNN or an LSTM in Flux. So we've tried to keep it pretty user-friendly in that regard. So that's kind of the general package structure. I've got about five minutes left or so. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of what we've actually used this for so far. And like I said, I think there's a lot of use cases for this. So if you have any suggestions, please let me know at the end of this talk. I'd be happy to help out or take any suggestions on board. 
The first thing we did was just robust image classification. I guess the most the, the motivation for this, as I said at the start, when you have uh, images and you add some kind of pixelated disturbance to it, then we change the classification. So we thought, all right, let's see if we can do that properly. Here's an example just with the MNIST data set. So for those unfamiliar, MNIST is just a bunch of handwritten numbers. And the typical problem is figure out what the number is based on the pixel data. So in this case, I've trained one of my LBDNs, the static models with a Lipschitz bound. I've trained it to classify these numbers and it figures them out pretty well. And it actually performs reasonably similarly to just like a flux dense network. The cool part is what happens when I perturb the image. So this graph here on the x-axis, I have basically a perturbation size. So I'm just adding like random noise to the image as a percentage of like image pixel strength. So the 0.8 here means the maximum, so it's just like a uniform random sampling. So the 0.8 means that the largest disturbance is 80% of the original pixel data. Oh, sorry, 80% of like a full pixel data. So what we see here is the test accuracy, so high is good, um, of our OBDN stays pretty constant even as we increase the perturbation size. So as I add more and more noise to the image, the LBDNs are still pretty good at classifying the MNIST data set. If I just take a flux dense model though, it drops off immediately and it gets down to absolutely unusable performance within, let's say, you know, half the perturbation size. So just by having these Lipschitz bounds inside, we can already make sure that our models are much more robust to image classification. For those of you that work in the field, you'll know that, uh, sorry, and also I should mention here, a smaller Lipschitz bound is kind of more robust here because it means the model's smoother, like I described at the start. For those of you that are kind of used to working in image classification, you know MNIST is not a very difficult problem. Uh, we've also done this on things like SciFi 10, SciFi 100, Tiny ImageNet, uh, kind of more interesting problems, and we've seen the same results. So here, we've actually got like a convolutional version of our LBDN, which I haven't written in our Julia package yet. It's in Python, sorry, uh, but going to be translated soon. And you can see, so the x-axis there is the Lipschitz bound we've imposed on the model. And as we make the Lipschitz bound smaller, so the network's smoother, then in this perturbed case, the accuracy improves because it's more robust to disturbances. And down the bottom right here is a convolutional neural network, which again, can't do anything as soon as you perturb it a little bit. So that's one cool use case. Another really cool use case, and this is actually basically like my entire PhD in like one and a half slides, so um, is robust reinforcement learning. So I won't go into huge amounts of detail here, but this is, this is super interesting stuff. Basically, it's possible to do reinforcement learning over just stabilizing controllers uh, for a dynamical system if you use a particular controller structure. That we, I won't go into the theory, but it's called the Euler controller. Basically, if you have a contracting neural network, which is our stability property, property in this package, if you have a contracting neural network and you use this controller framework, you can guarantee that any controller you try, uh, you try and your reinforcement learning kind of trial and error strategy, it's always going to be stabilizing. So the way we tend to use this is, let's say we have some system, you might have seen like the uh, rotary arm pendulums on the Julia Hub desks uh, up in the main area. Let's say we've got some controller that allows it to stabilize, but it's not super high performance. Uh, we can do some learning over that to make sure that it improves its performance without losing any stability. So if I poke it, it's not more likely to fall over, it's just better, it's gonna respond better when I do poke it. And we've shown that we can actually do some pretty interesting stuff. So this is on a particular system where the optimal solution for the controller is actually very close to an instability bound. So it's very unrobust by definition. If I train things with my special Euler controller and a contracting network, I get pretty close to the optimal bound. And this is a really simple linear problem. So we can easily write down the optimal bound, but it's kind of just to demonstrate the point. The red X's on this other method here are to show when it trials an unstable controller. And it turns out that it trials it pretty early on in the training process and it get, can't get unstuck from that region. It finds something that's reasonably good, and it turns out that it performs pretty similarly over the training horizon compared to our special controllers. But the catch is when you evaluate it for a longer time horizon. So a big thing in reinforcement learning is often people will train something over, say, let's say, like, I don't know, 100 seconds, but then they want it to run on a robot for like two days. Now, you need it to be stable over the two days, not just the 100 seconds. And this here shows that both of our controllers are fine in the region they've been trained. But as soon as we take it into a further time horizon beyond where it's been trained, this other controller goes completely unstable, whereas 
our Euler controller is completely stable still because of this contraction property that's built into the neural networks. So this is some really interesting stuff. If you're interested, again, come chat to me afterwards. Uh, but it's only because we've got these stability properties built into our robust neural networks that I can actually do this kind of stuff. The last case, and this is, I guess, for people interested in uh, estimation, um, this is an interesting case we've figured, uh, if you've ever heard of like a Kármán filter or an extended Kármán filter, these are what we call observers or state estimators. Basically, it's a way of figuring out what the state of a dynamical system is based on just measurements. So for example, I might want to figure out what position and velocity my little rover is at just based on like bearing measurements or some camera sensor. Turns out you can design uh, observers or uh, state estimators that are guaranteed to converge to the true solution if you have this contraction property in your neural network. So a really simple case is like a box on two, mounted on two springs that kind of oscillates back and forth. And just by observing the position, it, my neural network can actually figure out what the velocity should be over some sort of finite time. So you can see all the velocity signals down the bottom right. The velocity error actually converges pretty nicely um, to the true solution. So that's pretty cool. And we can also do this on really complicated stuff like PDEs. So this was a reaction diffusion equation basically by like sampling just a few sites in our uh, grid space, we could figure out what the entire state of the PDE was just with these contracting neural networks. And in fact, all we actually had to train this on was the one step ahead prediction error, and then it's guaranteed to be stable and, and converging for the entire thing. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. So that kind of brings me to the end of my talk. Basically, this is our new package, robustneuralnetworks.jl. Like I said, it's a package for general machine learning with a kind of control twist and flavor to it. Um, and we've got these robustness guarantees built into the models, and I think that's what the interesting thing about it is. It's easy to use with existing machine learning tools like the Flux library and Julia, and it's all written in native Julia, and it's available on the general package registry if you want to check it out. Uh, we've got a paper on archive that I plan to submit to the JuliaCon proceedings as well, so if that's kind of got a tutorial of how to use it if you'd like to check it out, or if you're more comfortable looking at the docs, it's there too, so you can scan the QR codes and have a look. But uh, thank you for coming and look forward to answering your questions. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll probably speak to you offline as well. But uh, if I understand the mapping part correctly, it's essentially just a very clever form of regular, regular, uh, regularizing the, the, the weights, or not, not quite? <laughs> Uh, not quite, so we can go into detail later, but basically um, there's kind of a linear matrix inequality that has to be satisfied for certain robustness properties to exist, and we basically do the mapping so that the eventual structure of the network fits that linear matrix inequality. So rather than solving a semi-definite program or whatever, we just kind of construct it so it's automatically satisfied. So it's not like a, it's, I guess, sort of a regularization, but it's kind of a bit more involved than that, yeah. Do we have more questions? How fast does this converge? How fast does it converge? Uh, in, in what problem? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes very slow, sometimes very quickly, but that's no, no slower or faster than any other kind of stuff. It depends how you set it up. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my question is because um, next to Flux, there's also Lux. Mm. Uh, do you support also this neural network framework? Um, not yet. I only became aware of Lux like maybe a couple of months ago. Um, and it's basically just me writing this package. So when I get time, I'm going to increase support to that. But at the moment, yeah, just Flux. But I think our framework could work quite well with Lux as well because they separate right. like, parameterization. Thank you. Not. We can take a very quick question. Uh, so uh, just uh, imposing the uh, the bounds you have on robustness, I assume that would have the cost, uh, has some computational cost yeah. uh, for the training. Yes. Uh, so can you give us just a, like a ballpark, you know, how, how much how much does that cost in terms of you want to build a neural network? You know? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. It actually it kind of depends on which constraint you want to impose. Um, it is going to be slower. I, a ballpark, maybe like five times slower for the static case for a current neural network, maybe like a couple of times slower. Like it's not like an order of magnitude slower, 
but it is a little bit slower um, because yeah, there's there's some kind of matrix inverses that have to happen there. Working on speeding that up, um, but it's the kind of thing like if you want to impose stability guarantees, this is faster than any other method. If you don't want to impose stability guarantees, then don't use this. So, yeah. All right, let's sing again, Nicholas. Thank you.